Alan Monroe and I are, uh, are co-directing the Center for Cognitive Technology. We're going to give a brief on some of what we're doing at the center. And um, I think both of us uh, sort of prefer an interactive thing. So if you, uh, and, and we're not going to take an hour. Hi, come on, Andrew. So if you have any questions or want to stop someplace and chat a bit, please feel free. We'll get us through uh, whatever we have. I think I only have eight or nine slides here anyway. So, all right, let's start out by saying that um, Here's the list of the people at the center. Hey, come, Hi. come on in. <laughs> um, we really are, here, here's the funding agencies, that, or here's our mission. We, uh, uh, we're basically, our definition of technology is evidence-based practice, trying to capture research on things like learning, motivation, and so on, and then translate it into strategies that can be used. So that's our view of technology. What, we use it in both senses, not only as science-based practice or evidence-based practice, but also as media, because we have really two arms in the center, one of which looks at things like instructional design and development and so on, and the other which builds very sophisticated simulations. Uh, and uh, many of us, uh, Sean Gurley's at the center, many of us work on, uh, on uh, with people that do high-end simulations and games and try to include uh, some decent pedagogy in that work. So uh, the, we have a variety of funding agencies. Matter of fact, I don't know how many individual grants we have, but it's more it's more than comfortable. If we didn't have Donna Darling to keep us straight, we'd be in a mess. Uh, they sort of vary between somewhere around twenty thousand dollars to I don't know what's the largest now. Right now, I think about three hundred eighty. Three hundred eighty thousand. They've been up to a million. So they, we have in the past up to a million dollars, but now it seems like smaller grants. They, they're, the duration is between 12 to 18 months. There are no, there's no long-term funding in the centers all that much anymore. We have full overhead on most of what we do. The overhead is off campus, which is significantly less than the on-campus. That is a benefit to us. Turns out to be a benefit to the school too, because our take is that the amount of money that we cost the school actually nets them more at the end of the day than it does a full overhead rate for an on-campus uh, grant. Uh, plus, we get to sit over in Redondo Beach, <laughs> and when we open the windows, we don't hear traffic. We hear the seals barking in the shore over next to us. So, um, so here's the two types of projects. I'm going to talk about the second area first. That's the area that. Uh, Alan handles the simulations and the more media-based technology as simulation stuff, whereas the rest of us deal, uh, Alan and Quint, uh, whereas the rest of us deal with uh, technology in the sense of instructional design strategies and so on and so forth. And I, I thought rather than start out with a list of projects, I'd start out with kind of a list of what we think we've learned in the last uh, four years or five years that we've been working over there. Um, you can read it, I won't read it to you, but basically what it comes down to is we've taken a real specific approach to instruction and the design of instruction, and one that's based on what's called cognitive load theory. And a lot of the research that people like John Sweller and Richard Mayer and so on have been doing on cognitive load. Uh, we've also done a lot of work in instructional design, and we've done a lot of reviews, and the bottom line for us is we've decided that something that uh, people are calling direct instruction, that is showing people how to do things as opposed to telling them what to do and letting them discover how, is what works. So we're, we're very much into this direct instruction thing. Um, we have uh, we've really developed some systems that we think implement it in a variety of settings. We've done the implementation ourselves, we're evaluating it, but I think this is, uh, at least for my take to begin with, this is the best expression I can make of what the assumptions are that we make. Um, here are some of the projects that we have now in, in our half of the house. Um, we have a series of studies that we have run with the Keck School of Medicine that implement this, this interview strategy we use for capturing expertise for training called cognitive task analysis. We published a number of those studies. The results were so dramatic that actually the interest is national and international now. Most of the studies have actually come out of USC. We're going to continue with that this year. We're going to have a, a EDD cohort. We've made an alliance with, uh, you all know Morris Sullivan, Dr. Morris Sullivan, who's teaching classes now for us as a, as a courtesy appointment. 
and uh, Maura will be working with us. And we've got uh, faculty in the School of Medicine that are willing to collaborate. We're going to do a series of more studies in the next few years on this cognitive task analysis thing. Uh, we do a lot of reviews of research on, on expertise and how to extract it. Uh, this is where we begin to get evidence for this principle we've developed that about 70% of the, of the knowledge that an expert has is pretty much automated and unconscious. They can't tell somebody how they do what they do even if they want to and so that's why this, this cognitive task analysis interview strategy is so important to us. Um, and uh, we do our series of studies on cross-cultural negotiation. Well, everything from trying to understand what culture means when you're trying to work with people between cultures to how do you train people to work effectively with people in other cultures. And the way we started out with that is a, is a series of, uh, of both instructional programs and studies on negotiation. So we've interviewed some of the top State Department negotiators, a lot of negotiators have worked with the military, uh, and we have developed a course in how to negotiate with people from Middle Eastern backgrounds. That now is going to get extended to a series of uh, studies uh, and simulations on other cultures. Uh, and it, the attempt is to develop some coursework for, for high school level people. And so what I, we're working with ICT, the Institute for Creative Technology on this. What they want to do is set up, they have a program um, where you choose avatars and you train your avatar to work with another avatar and they're going to they're gonna actually have avatars that you are asked to go and get a date with. I, we didn't decide this, okay? But this is how they're going to try to train people to, to deal cross culture because a lot, of the, a lot of the younger people, for example, coming into the military, when you talk about culture, they have no idea what you're talking about. And to try then to be, to get them to actually get into it and to understand how to deal with the people from different cultures, you need a vehicle that's going to motivate them. So they think this dating program is going to, going to work. That's actually kind of interesting. I've seen well, some of Well, it's interpersonal, so it would make sense that that's yeah. where you really have to dig deep in terms of culture. And while you don't actually get a date, that's really important. Right. At the end of the day, you get a score. I mean, right. did you connect or did you not? How far did you get with this person? Are they even willing to talk to you again? And so on and so forth. But so they're going to the then... Net What's the that? It's sort of through the avatar, it provides a safety net so they can try it out. Yeah. Uh, and screw up and yeah. it's still okay, just got a bad score. So it'll all be on the computer, it'll all be yeah. kind of interacting with the computer rather than, although I think they do want them to do it in groups and so on. But So that's a, that's a new project we're, we're going to develop. Um, one of the major things we've done in the last four or five years is uh, as a result of a request from the Army actually is develop an instructional design strategy we call Guided Experiential Learning, or GEL. Anybody who knows anything about instructional design would not be surprised at the elements of it. It's standard stuff, but the, at the heart of it, the important part is that it actually deals a lot with how to do things, how to make decisions, how to make judgments, as well as what to do in certain situations. And a lot of practice and feedback uh, uh, when people are, are learning. We have a leadership study with, uh, that started out with USC students. Sean has taken the lead on that. And uh, it's, it's, train, it's, it's training people to implement a, a one of the, what's this called, structure? Situation. Situational Leadership Theory, SLT, that old stuff. But uh, it's, it's a module where we choose different ways to teach it, including this gel approach is one of them. It's online. We've got a lot of, uh, of USC graduate students that have signed up and taken it, and now it's being extended out. We're going to go to West Point. West Point Cleaves are going to take it and so on. And we're going to see if it, it, we've got some pretty good data. Sean, mm -hmm. just finished the analysis. It looks good. Yep. Well, I'm going to show some of the preliminary data in a second. Sean's also interested in the sense of presence stuff. You ought to be talking about this, Sean. But it, it's a, the question that, that we want to ask also is if you're, how, how important is it when you're learning from some kind of multimedia or televised instruction that you get a sense that it's real on the screen? Or that, when, when your sense of reality increases, does it engage you more, do you learn more? And it's being called SOP, or sense of presence. It used to be called... Telepresence. What was it? Telepresence. Telepresence, but there was something even before that. I mean, when I went to school 100 years ago, it was called... Fidelity. Mm -hmm. 
No, I'll come to me. See, that's the problem being old. They can't even remember what it was called, so it doesn't matter. Uh, all right, so that's basically the projects that we have. Uh, here are the products that we've developed. We have this cognitive task analysis protocol that we can train other people and have trained other people to use now. We want to continue to do that. So we have a have, version have for have medicine. Questions? We have a version that. Go if ahead. we have questions, should we just wait to the end? No, no, go ahead. Okay. Well, like for the CTA, do you have like assessment protocols that go with the design protocol? What are you using to? Yes. Yeah, whenever we have. Um, Whenever we have a protocol, that is, the tr for example, the gel model, mm -hmm. when, it, when it works with this cognitive task analysis, mm -hmm. we have a way to assess performance that's okay. related. Like and pre and post-test kinds of measures? Yeah, it, it actually has to do with two part, a two-part thing. One is declarative knowledge, obviously, mm -hmm. that's a very typical thing. But the other is, how do you assess whether people are accurately performing a procedure if the procedure involves a lot of decisions, for example? Mm -hmm. That's the part I'm really Yeah, yeah, it's a tough thing. But we use a checklist that's based on the steps in the procedure. And, and so we do sort of a, an assessment that's graduated across the... Uh, and we're, we're not totally happy with it yet, but we're happier than we were when we started. Um, this bilateral negotiation, we have this uh, strategy that's based on a combination of the cognitive task analysis that we did and the Harvard Getting to Yes program, which a lot of people are familiar with. It turns out the State Department uses it, <coughs> as well as a lot of the top negotiators that we interviewed. So we have put the two together and we tried to add a cultural component to that Harvard Getting to Yes strategy. It's really effective, I think. And then uh, Sean's plan, and I hope he continues with it, is eventually to develop a measure for this sense of presence. A way to more accurately measure when people have suspended disbelief, which is now I've got it. That's what it used to be called, the suspension of disbelief. Um, and, and when they actually feel that something they're watching or experiencing is more real or less real, even though it's artificial. Um, some of the studies we've conducted just quickly, the uh, surgeon study, we got an average of about 40% more learning, 30% faster with this uh, cognitive task analysis in gel. That, by the way, was compared with, wait, let me show you the study. Uh, just to get an idea of how we are doing these studies, we took half of all of the students that were going through surgical residencies in one year, and they went through a, a, uh, 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 the, the usual way to teach them to do a particular surface, uh, procedure that all surgeons have to learn. And uh, that, pr that strategy is you watch an expert do it, while he or she describes to you how to do it. Then the next time you do it, while the expert steps back and says, oh, don't, don't cut that or don't do that. And then the third time you train somebody else to do it while the expert watches you train them. They call it see one, do one, teach one. It's very traditional in surgery. So we took the experts that train the surgeons with those C1 and one and we interviewed them with cognitive task and also we developed a separate strategy which is this CTA and gel based instruction where we show people how to do this step by step but more importantly how to make the decisions they had to make. So we had the two groups, about 12, 14 uh, MDs in each one of the two groups and uh, we did pretest the, uh, the what we call the SME base, that's subject matter expert, that's the C1, do one, teach one group, and the Joe with the CTA was the experimental group. They had a higher pretest score, and we did two types of tests. One was a more declarative, what memory did they, could they remember the procedure, could they remember why they were doing it, and so on, as well as a performance score. That is, could they actually do the procedure with somebody standing there with a checklist who was blind as to which group they had been trained in? And here's the results we got. Uh, we were surprised at the increase in the memory scores, a 20% difference in memory. Uh, we're not surprised at the performance difference. The key thing here is that not only did they, the experimental group have a 40% better performance, but somebody with, with approximately 25 people doing this procedure in the, fir the first time in the first year they're out of medical school during their internship, they kill one patient by accident. That's the average. And that's, a, that's why we work in medicine, because they keep track of their mistakes. And uh, nobody got killed, but somebody actually did get killed in the 
control group, but the experimental group not only didn't kill anybody, they didn't hurt anybody. So the number of mistakes is less important than the severity of the mistakes. I shouldn't be saying this on tape. That's not something that went into the report ever. But it's, it's, it's the way that they deal they with it. They talk that way in yeah. medical school all the time. What do they call it? M&M? &M? Morbidity and mortality yeah. conferences. They, they, they're, they're forced to have it. And another surprise is that we got, a, a, it took less time to train people with this gel CTA system than it took with the C1, do one, teach one. The key thing is that the expense is up front in designing the instruction, where it takes 20 to 30 percent longer to design instruction using this approach of ours. But the benefit is it takes students less time to learn. They make fewer mistakes. They're more able to apply as soon as they're finished with the instruction. Uh, there's some experiments years ago, not through the center with patent examiners, where we got huge increases in the, uh, uh, in the efficiency of their training. Uh, we've done some meta-analyses on this stuff. One of the students here in an EDD program, Lee, did a meta-analysis and found an average 47% increase. That is an effect size of what, about one point, I forget. Probably, uh, I can't reverse math the thing, but it's one point, so it's a very large effect size. And uh, we get the benefit with the USC students uh, in the study that we have right now, of Sean's, that looks to be somewhere around 40 to 50% greater learning with this approach. Um, here's the current study we're doing with USC and West Point students. The three different versions of the uh, uh, condition that teaches this leadership theory. Uh, we have two types of tests, a memory, a recall test, plus an application, a performance test that asks them primarily to classification tasks. Sean, I'm, it's mostly that, isn't it? Classification. Mm -hmm. yep. In other words, is this an example of this type of leadership style? Did this person accurately classify the, the, uh, the leadership ability or characteristics of a subordinate? We show them a number of videos. And they have to then, they, they both see video as they're learning to apply this during the time they're practicing. And when they are testing, they'll see a video and they'll be asked questions about the video. So we have two types of, of measures. And I think all we knew as of the time I was putting this together was we got about 40%, 48% higher scores on the gel approach than we did on the other. And we got something we didn't expect, which we're going to, I want us to follow up on, and that is that. The trainees were really good, much better at classifying leadership styles than they were at understanding the characteristics of subordinates. In other words, they're, in this situational leadership, you're asked to analyze the background of a subordinate before you give them a task. And you tailor the way that you describe a task to them based on your analysis of their background. And people are really good at classifying what type of task was given and how it was given by leaders, they were significantly less able to classify the capability of the subordinates, it looked like. Mm -hmm. And there's, a, uh, there's a, 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 a leadership special issue in the American Psychologist here uh, a couple months ago. And by the way, if you read a number of those articles, it comes to the conclusion that the, one of the problems of leadership research is it focuses on leaders mm -hmm. and not on their relationships with subordinates. And this, I think, validates that people are very focused on leadership and not focused on the relationships that they have in organizations. It, my question is actually for Sean. Mm -hmm. So the situation is in the video, like vignette. Is that the situation? So that they're when they're doing the analyses. Uh, I, I'm sort of that part of it. Yes, yeah. I mean the uh, different name for SLT could be contextualized leadership. Mm -hmm prescriptive matches, but that's less catchy. Right. So what they have, the task that they have to do, uh, the learner eventually has to perform is to, to categorize the subordinate's needs and then Looking figure out. Looking at the video, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then figure out whether or not the actions that the leader took, well, which sort of leadership style the person was using, and then whether or not that was appropriate. Um, and they're all, very, very fancy videos, like little movies from actual events in the Middle East. You can they were developed by ICT. Oh, ICT got them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they're super, super, super high quality. 
in our half of the house right now, I would say 85% um, of our income is coming now from ICT. The Institute of Creative Technologies bypasses grants through to us to do work that they've contracted to do. So we do a lot of work for them. Yeah, the only other thing that's come up in the analysis that's probably worth mentioning is that um, the main effect uh, that has led to these performance differences between groups uh, turns out to be the treatment condition. So. To be what? <laughs> it's the treatment condition that makes the biggest difference. So. Can you uh, describe the treatment condition in more detail? Uh, sure. Very briefly, the treatment condition the, what they get that the mid-range condition doesn't get, the mid-range condition gets some practice. Uh, and the main thing that the high-end condition gets is that they find out whether or not their answers were correct. Uh, so when they're doing these practice exercises, they get corrective feedback about their choices. It's response dependent. So it's not often in online uh, data collection, the the feedback is not response contingent. It'll just be like, yeah, well, if you think about it in this way, you would have chosen, you know, yeah. but in this case, the, the online system that ICT developed allows you to make response contingent feedback. So that's really the main difference between the, mid, between the middle condition and the middle condition. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at literature on giving feedback during learning. It's all over the map. It's really almost impossible to generalize when you look at it. But in all the studies we've done, it turns out to be one of the most powerful variables is giving immediate feedback before people get the wrong idea about something right. and go off of it. It's like meeting somebody for the first time and calling them by the wrong name and then trying to correct later and find out it wasn't, you know, Bob, it was Bo or something like that. It it's, it's really makes a difference. So we're committed to constant observation and practice for immediate feedback when people screw up. Tried the uh, just-in-time testing. Uh, you know what that is? Just-in-time testing. For example, if you wanted to check to see if uh, we're learning now, and also let us know if we're learning now, you could flash a couple of multiple-choice test yes. questions on. We you. have a strategy to it, which people call out. Ben Marion board calls part for the full test practice, and all the practice we ever at the we have a rule which says that. Either every lesson or no more than three lessons can occur. And a lesson, by the way, is defined as a procedure that takes about 10 to 15 steps to learn. You have to have an applicant, you have to have a hands-on practice. And in that practice, you have to give, you have to observe and give corrective feedback. And if we, we think of those practices as tests. But we and, and we don't just pop them, we actually give them systematically. And then every so many of these part task practices. You have to have a whole task practice, which pulls them all together, and they practice it all. And then at the end, we require a whole task practice where they have to do the whole thing from start to finish. Is your group doing the designing the just-in-time? I mean, sorry, I'm mixing Dennis's comments. Sorry, but I would think of it as just-in-time feedback. It goes it is part of the right. Package. Are your groups designing that part? Because yes. it's really tricky to give the kind of feedback that. Is meaningful in a different way than when you know when Sean ex described the non-example, the real meaningful example. It's kind of tricky. We actually have a way. We have a strategy for giving feedback that we based on a meta-analysis that was done a few years back by Kluger and the DC. Mm -hmm. You know where they looked at all the different feedback strategies yeah. and found out that a third of them actually make performance worse. Yeah. Remember the, the, another the third. Yeah. The types they said make no difference at all. Right. And there's a third of them that, that you get a, at least a one sigma right. advantage if you use them. And the bottom line is, in giving feedback, somebody makes a mistake, you don't say, you made a mistake. You say, let's talk about the strategy you're using right now. Right. I mean, the, the feedback is about strategy, right. about approach, about method. It's not about the person. Mm -hmm. And it makes a huge difference. Right. That article, but that it has to be constant. Really powerful. And you know, this is interesting because a lot of people in instruction now, at, who are actually involved in adult training, will tell you not to give feedback, immediate, and and delay feedback, and only to give it occasionally, and so on, or let the trainee decide when they need feedback. Even Bob Bork at UCLA, who's a pretty serious player in training, adult, professional education, is coming up with that, and they base it on a couple of strange studies with fourth graders. 
in, 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 in language development, which I think is totally inappropriate. That's well, not what we found. Even in language found, development, the feedback you know. would be useful. Yeah. <laughs> can can yeah. you say something about the, the costs? You, you alluded to the upfront costs of, uh, you know, I love to see 40% gains in achievement and effect sizes of that size, but obviously it comes down to cost effectiveness. Yeah. So it, it, and I, you know, we haven't done the cost studies, but want to. Yeah. Um, uh, who was it? Uh, did the cost effectiveness book that, that two parter? Um, Levin, Hank Levin. Yeah. Yeah. Hank's, Hank's, Hank's approach is the one we like to, like to take. It's the uh, cost replacement approach. Yeah. And I, I really would like to get some support to do this. Um, my take, however, is you have to look at who's benefiting as well as what it costs because our take is the benefit's going to be students that are the most disadvantaged, are the most sort of out of the system and not succeeding. And if that requires more expense up front, for the benefit, I think you have to weigh not just the cost in dollar terms or time terms, but the cost in social terms. Yeah. And, and I, we'd love to find somebody to support a study like that. Yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting, and particularly, I mean, what's interesting is that Institutions like public K-12 schools are not very good at absorbing large upfront costs. The military is, for example, is willing to put investments generally with returns later, but, but the structure of K-12, for example, in the public sector is, it, it's, it's all oriented against making decisions yeah. that require upfront yeah. investments. So, That's the biggest problem is a lot of the decisions that they make. Right. Show us how we can do it cheaper. Right. It's the goal. Not better, right. but cheaper mm -hmm. and quicker. And if we have to lose a little bit of the results to do that, that's fine, provided we don't lose too much. That's the general attitude. Um, which is why I think the benefit here is going to primarily be recognized in government and in schools, uh, and not probably in, co in the corporate world. Although, corporations have tried this approach. And interestingly, even at fairly high levels, like people would do, one of the consulting companies in the United States that a very high level change, organizational change consulting has tried this, and they've had a huge result from it with their, uh, with their employees. But they tell us that it costs five times more than what they were doing. Right? Mm -hmm. Five times more. Yeah, but they think that the benefit for them was great enough that they're going to continue with it. Because they just said you have to amortize the cost over a number of years because once you get one of these how-tos captured and organized, all you have to do is tune it and tweak it as the approach changes over time. Okay, and I'll uh, finish up here in a second. Let me go to the end. Here's where we're going next. We want to continue the CTA and gel stuff. We'd really like the opportunity to try this in a, a K-12 setting. So next year, we're going to think about a cohort, an EDD cohort, in a school district where we'll go in and do the gap analysis, but also use the gel and the CTA stuff to try to, to do some interventions. Uh, we're going to continue to work in medicine. Tech has asked us to come back this next year. So the EDD cohort for this fall is going to be working at Keck with primarily with trauma surgeons, I think. Um, we want to continue with the sense of presence stuff. If Sean can, decides to continue with it, a measurement there would really make a huge difference to research in that area. Uh, we're going to continue to do the cultural sensitivity training. And I talked to you briefly about the new study that involves the dating mm -hmm. routine as a way to teach uh, high school kids how to appreciate different cultures and how to interact with people from different cultures in a respectful and supportive way. And then we want to study different strategies for organizational change. That's a new approach for us. Uh, I've come to the conclusion you can have the best system in the world, and as you were starting to describe, you've got to get people to modify the way they do things in order to get them to use it. And it's that change that actually a lot of really great programs fall down, because people just won't adopt them, or if they put them into practice, they basically defeat them. Uh, what is it, the National Academy of Sciences study of all of the published accounts of change strategies and organizations say that 70% of them fail within the first two years. And they don't fail because they don't work, they fail because people resist them to the point where they just simply can't implement them. So that change becomes something that we think is we're going to have to add to what we do in order to be effective. Okay, that's actually the first part. Now, Alan is going to uh, talk about the, uh, the other part of the center, the other half of the center, which... And let me see if I can get you up there. There you go.
Thanks, Dave. So, I have too many slides, so I'll sort of <laughs> do some of them real quick. Um, this is going to be sort of the uh, techie approach in some ways. Uh, we're interested in working on training and learning about very complex things, procedures and systems that are hard to learn how to make use of. And uh, we believe, in part because Dick has uh, helped us to understand this, that cognitive task analysis is an important front-end uh, aspect of all of that. Um, but then, in any kind of instruction about procedures, you typically need to demonstrate what needs to be done. You need to guide people to do it themselves and explain why. You need to give them practice on how to do it. And you need to assess whether they're doing it correctly so you know whether you need to give them more practice or more explanation. Now, there is this uh, never-dying controversy about how much guidance is appropriate in learning this kind of thing. And there are many people who have a religious perspective which says that it is immoral <laughs> to provide guidance to people. This is not our belief because we think they're much less likely to learn uh, if you don't. And we'll say a little more about that. So we think it's immoral not to give guidance in some sense. Uh, but uh, hopefully we can phrase it in such a way that it's sometimes an empirical question and we can find out. Um, so we're developing tools and technologies, and that's a lot of our focus in our half of the house, and applying them in adult learning contexts. But it's our hope that in a future world, under future administrations, there might be funding available to try to apply some of the lessons we learn in adult education to uh, the education of children um, and young adults. Finally, I want to say just a word or two about the integration of work and learning, and I think this is one place where we have the best hope of making an impact with this kind of technology. Um, so, why do we use computers to teach? Well, one advantage, of course, is that we can individuate. We can treat different people differently, and uh, the more we do this, the more likely we are to get some benefits. In particular, we might get uh, people to learn things more quickly because we won't teach them things they already know. A lot of times this is done in a very boring way by having a book on the computer and you decide what pages to show them. Uh, we're interested in a different approach, which is instead of having a book type uh, an analysis of what is to be taught, we have a world analysis of what is to be taught. We put them in the world and the world interacts and behaves. And they learn about the world by touching it, doing things, seeing how the world behaves, and being guided to see how the world behaves. And how to use the world uh, to accomplish the things they need to do. So uh, typically we do this by demonstrating and explaining, then we have, them have practice with some guidance, and then we assess them to see what they know. Now one of the things that we think is interesting about assessing people in a sort of task-like context is that one of the things people often do with tests is to try to make sure that they get a normal distribution. So some people have to not do very well. And if you have really good instruction and you have a sort of criterion notion, that might be hard. Everybody might learn the task. So they phrase some of the questions in such a way that there are center embedded clauses or something like that. And some people will have charged their memory limitations, which mean that they won't do so well on that, even though they might actually do fine doing the job in the real world. When we first started showing people um, some of the graphics tools where they would demonstrate their knowledge by, for example, if you were a, a Navy tactician and you were placing ships in such a way as to defend an aircraft carrier. Uh, when we, we came in, they didn't see what we were doing. Someone comes in and says, oh, what are you doing? Well, we're doing assessment. Oh, I hate assessment. I always did badly at assessment. Well, here's how it works. You drag these things into position and we judge whether you put them in the right places and assign them the right roles. I can do that. I know how to actually do the task, so that's no problem. Um, so it's a much fairer, perhaps, approach to assessment sometimes. Uh, I'm not going to go into most of the examples, but basically you've got worlds where people can move things around, they can draw lines, they can position objects, and everything should behave functionally in the important ways, in terms of learning uh, the task, the way the real objects do. Uh, that there's an interesting question about realism and it's current belief in our half of the house that 
the important realism is the behavioral realism, not the visual realism or the tactile experience for most types of training. Um, the other thing we can do in this type of environment is that we can present aspects of what is being learned that are not actually present in the real world. So we can have imaginary vectors uh, out there that show what the, this is supposed to be an aircraft carrier, it's moving that way, and here's an apparent wind which is forward of, toward the bow relative to the true wind. Um, and we can give them a little control that lets them modify what the ship's speed is. And when they do that, they see that if they make the ship go faster, the apparent wind is higher and it moves more toward the bow. And they can experiment. We give them controls for separately controlling the speed of the wind, the direction of the ship, the uh, speed of the ship, and so on, so that they can see what all these interrelationships are. But we don't just trust them to figure it out on their, on their own. We first guide them to do it, and then we let them experiment. Um, so I'm not going to repeat this mantra again, but you've already heard it a couple of times. Um, demonstrate, provide practice, and uh, provide assessment. Um, now, there are some cases where we do believe in discovery learning, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, this is that uh, case of doing an aircraft carrier defense. You can teach people novology if you want, where they learn about how to uh, run propulsion control systems on ships. Here's an example that relates a little bit more to K-12, where someone is learning what Galileo figured out. But we don't want to just give them some ramps like Galileo had and some balls to roll down it. Galileo had to time things with a bucket to, to he poked a hole in the bottom of and cut, caught some water that fell out to see how much time had gone by. We give him an electronic timer, so that makes it a little easier. Um, don't have to weigh the water at the end of it. Uh, but, you know, Galileo figured it out on his own with these ramps. But, gee, he was the first guy who'd done that in how many years, right? So we don't really want to expect every fifth grader to necessarily figure it out on his own just because he has some ramps. So, going to provide them some guidance uh, and lead them to uh, understand it. So, and perhaps when we're done, or at various points in it, we'll give them some free play opportunities as well. All right. Uh, how does this all work? Well, we have some pieces of technology. There's two primary pieces of software, iRides Author and iRides itself. This is a delivery piece of software. It reads in two kinds of files. One describes a simulation, and the other describes a lesson or an assessment that should be offered in the context of that simulation. And these two work together in iRides to provide a learning experience for a student. And the way this is created is in a WYSIWYG environment in which people can draw objects that are going to be simulation objects. They can assign behaviors to the objects, and then they can furthermore build some instruction that can be delivered in the context. Uh, we think it's very important to not use exactly the same methodology to develop both the instruction and the simulation because you get a tangled mess. What you need to do is to be, have one notion about how the world works and you build a simulation that works that way and then you be separately build a variety of scripts that teach people about how to use the world and uh, that assess people in that world context. So for the simulation, uh, are the, are the parameters fairly narrow, so you're talking about kind of physical objects, or can you, can you put in human beings with behaviors, or...? So far, nobody has done a sort of social thing, and uh, it would be difficult. It's certainly doable, but you would have to build a whole library of simulation objects that eventually get you up to the right kind of behavior, because right now, uh, it's at a fairly low level. So we have values that can be text values, logical values, and numerical values, and so on. And you can write expressions that determine what the value of an attribute should be. So you could build up a lot of these things so that uh, you know there are a lot of theories of personality and other aspects of uh, uh, social organization and so on, affinity, all of these things. You could put those into a human being object and you could write rules, but um, it would be a substantial modeling task. I see teach doing that right now. I All right. Yeah. Right. I should take a look at it. I mean, the reason I ask is because I, I could go kind of shelve this question until the end, but 
Okay, so I foolishly volunteered during the summer to think about the redesign of inquiry our, in our, within our own EDD. Okay, so we, we were talking about these, this technology in the abstract, but in principle, one should be able to use these techniques to maximize learning of inquiry with our own educational leader trainees. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what I'm trying to think about, since it's in my mind from my first meeting this morning, is does this kind of approach have any possible application in this setting? So the reason I ask about the human beings is because one could imagine a simulation of you know, kids in a school district with data and personnel and learning trajectories and you know, different interventions that one could use in a school. And so I'm kind of thinking, you know, would it take me five years and $20 million to develop a simulation that the kids could learn in the class? Or would it be something that enough I of the technology you. exists that I could use elements of this to develop an intro, a learning experience for our EDD students that would actually help them learn inquiry methods <laughs> more than they do now? So uh, just as one of these uh, wild guess type things, you know, I'm guessing it would take you, starting with this kind of technology that we'd have, something like 10 months and $450,000. Okay. Uh, so it's the sort of thing that you, we might want to try to think of a way to get funded. Yeah. But that's uh, rather that, than to plan to right. do it that's for free to get going on. That, yeah. that kind of is doable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a feasible thing, but it's not a trivial thing. Oh, so basically, uh, there are several types of data that are created with this WYSIWYG authoring tool. This is just the underlying textual look. We think text storage of all of these things is very important rather than binary because uh, people sometimes invest a lot of money in the development of uh, training materials mm -hmm. and then technology moves on and they can't get anything out of it because it's in some proprietary binary format. So we're using XML and some other standard uh, by, uh, textual formats that will hopefully be useful in the future. And I won't go into the details about uh, how you specify the learning assistance, but it's typically done in dialogues, so it's, it's not a real complex thing. Although it's expressed underlyingly in an XML language, you don't have to use an XML tool to get at it. You can use these uh, dialogues to enter the data about uh, what should be said to people and what you require them to do to move on to the next item in, in the instructional script. So we use authoring tools to get faster development than we would get if we used more primitive tools. Uh, it gives us automatic flow of control. That means that typically a programmer using a programming language, one of the hardest things is figuring out what happens when and having a main event loop where everything that needs to be handled gets handled. We don't have to do that because we did it one time in the simulation engine. Now you just worry about the constraints that hold among the model objects in the world that you're simulating. Um, so that leads to more maintainable simulations that, uh, because the worlds we work in are always changing. People have new equipment or new uh, doctrine about what should happen in uh, these complex procedures. And so this gives you an opportunity to easily and quickly modify what you've got. Um, so uh, I've said some of that already. Um, and I've said why you don't want to build every simulation from scratch. It costs too much, and it's probably not going to be as good, especially it's not going to be as good for instruction, because this simulation engine offers all kinds of services that it can provide to the instructional engine that's interacting with the simulation engine. So there are two pieces inside iRides. One runs the simulation, and one delivers the instructional script and asks the simulation to do things for it, like stop for a minute, or change this value, or let me know if this expression ever becomes true, so that you can catch safety violations and other opportunities to teach that uh, might come up as a result of the student using the system. Um, so, so far, we thought originally that iRides would be used primarily to teach people how to carry out a bunch of procedures. But a lot of our, our people in the sponsoring community have been good at pushing us to solve 
more sort of complex cognitive training issues as well. So uh, we've developed some interactive graphics to help people understand some complex things in the world. And we'll get into one of those in just a minute, a minute. And then in addition, we can assess people, and we hope more fairly assess them than you can typically do with multiple choice questions, because it's task-based assessment with objective criteria. Now, here's an example of one of these environments in which we're teaching people a lot of complex aspects of solving a cognitive task. The task is doing the tactics for anti-submarine warfare. So here you are on a, on a group on the ocean. One of the things is a carrier. It's got 6,000 people on it, and they'll all die if you make a mistake because somebody, the submarine, will uh, hit it with a torpedo, and it will break in half and sink quickly. Um, so here's a typical problem someone might be presented where there's a little symbol out there that tells him that someone about half an hour ago reported that there was a periscope in this area, roughly there. And you can't see it here, but there's growing circles. As time passes, circles grow to show the uncertain area. The sub, depending on your estimate of the speed of the sub, it may have gone some distance from there. And there's an outer circle that shows it's, uh, the range of its torpedoes. That's a dangerous area that you want. This is a Straits of Gibraltar. You want your carrier and its, its escort to be able to get through without getting sunk. And so you, this is now a mental simulation. This part is what we imagine someone would do before they had the tool. They say, OK, I'll drop some sonoboys out there, and it'll detect the uh, submarine. And sure enough, here it is. There's a little red thing that is the detected submarine. And so I say, OK, I'll just move my guys out to the side where they're not at, and everything will be fine. But when you do this sort of thing, a mental simulation typically has trouble. It's the old three plus or minus two uh, business, um, or is it plus or minus one? Uh, uh, plus or minus one or two. Um, people can't, uh, can't keep track of all the likely motions and possible uh, states that things might be in. So you have a real simulation that they can control. So one of the things you discover when you have a real simulation is that, wow, that area is increasing. Even though an underwater submarine doesn't move very fast, not much time has to go by before there's a big area that's unknown. And you've put out these three sonoboys, but the type of sonoboy you chose only lasts for two hours. And the batteries are gone, and now they're dead, and you have no idea where this sub is. So uh, you say, boy, I need a better tactical plan. And so you try something else. You say, hey, you hit the, uh, the reset button, and you go back to the beginning of the scenario, and you try again. You choose a different type of sonoboy that lasts longer. Um, and as you move along, um, let's see, what's the order? Yeah. As you move along, the, the sub you see being detected, and so you lay out more sonoboys to track the direction it's going, and you decide, Oh, instead of sneaking by on that side, since it's going that way, I'm going to go along this way, and I'm going to escape. So you have a, a tactical plan that is more flexible, and that you've got to uh, sort of test some what-ifs in the condition of. Now, the thing that's interesting about this is that people, we built this to be a training tool. And it's got lots of things that I haven't shown you here that provide a lot of interesting graphics showing where danger areas are. People look at this and they say, huh, you know, we don't actually have anything out there in the water. This would be useful. We can use this as a tactical planning tool, and we'll have a better understanding of what we're doing. Because what we're doing right now is we're going to a whiteboard, and we're writing uh, symbols on the board about what's going to happen. And sometimes we're wrong, and we don't take everything into account. Now, this is where I think we finally have a chance to have people care about instruction, because they have to use the tool anyway, hopefully, to get the job done. What if their first exposure to the task is in the context of the tool and the tool teaches about the task? It would be interesting to think about a whole range of things that we might do like this because, face it, we live in a software-centric world. We're going to be seeing more and more specialized tools develop to help people make decisions. And there's no reason these tools can't also teach people a 
about the decision-making process in the context that they're in. Um, so, we have some planned research to treat cognitive load in the context of decision-making tools like this. We may do something for marine or army tactics. Um, I do hope you remember that you saw all those other simulations. We don't just do tactical and, and war type simulation stuff, but it looks like it's a good opportunity to do some real adult problem solving uh, issues. Um, and then this slide repeats the slide that we talked about earlier that Dick presented about our mission, our task, and our goal. So we were doing some very, uh, we had some interesting conversation going while Dick was up a minute ago, and I hope we can switch back to that. If, let if let me add one quick thing based on the questions that came up before. We were talking about assessment. Mm -hmm. uh, the Navy actually, uh, Alan does, oh, gets a lot of his support from the Navy. We get a lot of our support from the Army. You know, the Army actually has supported, I think, about 80% of all the research on instruction mm -hmm. in the last 50 years. I think people don't realize that most of the research for educational, at least pedagogical uh, research, comes from the military. 60% uh, of the military budget is tacked as training money, so they do a huge amount of training. Uh, the, one question is that, that they constantly ask is, how do you know when somebody doesn't need to be trained? Because they're constantly putting people through training courses that it turns out they don't need at all, they're wasting their time, they get irritated, they get bored, and so on. So the Navy actually did a very interesting study. Uh, I wish I had the results to show you, I've got a slide, but they tried three different conditions. First, they gave a pretest, which was like the pretest that we give, which is a cognitive, you know, true, false, multiple choice kind of thing about knowledge about the thing that's in the course. Something that would be sort of a selections from a final exam. The second condition they had was the number of years of experience in the area of the training. So they actually just asked people, how many years have you spent doing similar kinds of things? And they recorded that and used that number as a score. And the third thing they did was take simulations like Allen's. They put people in them. They created a situation and said, now what would you do? Guess which one accounted for almost all the variance of whether people needed the course or not? I mean, that was, that was hands down. It was the, can you hands on mm -hmm. handle a simulation like this and make some reasonable decisions? If somebody starts you out and says, Here's the condition, you have a ship here, and you've got submarines here, and so on and so on, and you have these resources you can call in, now what do you do next? And within two or three steps, they could identify people who did not need to go through the training. And they, they actually then trained people, and they followed them into the field to find out whether, in fact, their estimates were going to be accurate or not. And it's, I, I, so my take is that the work that Alan's doing is not only a good instructional tool, but it's a terrific assessment tool, not just for what people learn, but whether they need to be trained in the first place, which, which is, I think, increasingly a big issue. And it's even an issue in K-12. You know, a lot of kids in classes don't need the instruction they're getting. They could be doing something else. And we don't know who does and who doesn't. And the same thing is true for teacher training, because they keep yeah. adding like all yeah. these different tests that teachers have to go through to determine whether they will be able to teach. But it ends up being it doesn't determine whether they'll be effective teachers yeah. or not. So. And, and they have a lot of exercises like go and observe a classroom. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Uh, what are they observing? Yeah. Actually, what I. What do they get out of that? And it was Karen yeah, Gallagher was talking actually, about I'm it yesterday. Kind of, in the session. I was looking for a simulation because I I tried to um, look at the effects of stress on teacher decision making in the classroom management stuff, and I was actually looking for a simulation of the classroom situation so that I could get the teachers to kind of um, do their decision making through a simulation like that to assess how stress impacts that. I couldn't find a simulation like that, but I do know like it's a big issue for teacher training and the student teaching that you do for six months does not give you the type of experience on doing teacher uh, on making teach and making decisions in the classroom. So. Well, it may give you experiences, but no guidance. Exactly. So you're doing the discovery, yeah. you know, experiential learning without any guidance. Even so if you have once a week someone yeah. coming, but that's not sufficient. So I would be very interested. In um, what about adult learning at a much lower, lower level? Um, I, I teach uh, math, physics, math, and uh, in many instances, I end up having to teach basics of arithmetic and multiplication. Um, however, 
these adults are able to function in the real world. And I think that the skills that they would have to bring to the table in the real world, if seen in a, in a simulation uh, environment, might help them or strengthen their, their understanding of the, the concept that they're using to, uh, to do these things. Have that been explored? The question was about, uh, for just for the video, the question was about um, uh, what about situations? I, I, don't, don't let me put words in your mouth, but what I hear, hear from is what about situations where people might not be able to handle some of the conceptual stuff that is typically involved in training, but they can pick up how to do things and, and are very successful at it. I think that Alan was talking about something similar, mm -hmm. which is that, that a lot of the pretests, a lot of the testing that goes on in, in, in schools is for things that people actually don't need to know to learn how to do what they need to do to apply that knowledge once they finish school. And I think one of the things that surprised us constantly is the test data that we get back. The people that can do highly complex things can't pass tests about those highly complex things. They can do it. They can make the judgments. They can make decisions. They can solve the problems. But if you give them a conceptual test about that whole area, they'll fail the conceptual test. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, apparently, is that expertise becomes automated. I mean, they have a lot of experience. They've learned how to deal with similar problems. They can generalize that experience, but they're not aware of how they do it after a while because they become automated at it. So if you ask them questions about the conceptual approach to it, they can't answer the questions, but they can do what it is that they need to do. So on our take, it's the doing that's really critical, much more than it is the conceptual knowing about the doing. Uh, if you have to make a choice, I'd make it that way most of the time. Uh, you talked a little bit about cognitive cast analysis and interviewing, so I'm assuming sort of like a cognitive interviewing strategy that you use, and do you have a particular protocol that you use, or do you design it? Yes, we have a protocol we use. Ken Yates, who got his EDD here last mm -hmm. year, did a dissertation on all of the cognitive task analysis protocols that are out there. There's over a hundred of them. Mm -hmm. Most of them are not designed for teaching or instruction or training. They're mostly designed for uh, uh, expert systems mm -hmm. and simulations. Uh, the ones that are designed for training, he mm -hmm. found, kind of break into two groups. Uh, one group captures knowledge that's more conceptual. The other group captures knowledge that's more hands-on procedural. Mm -hmm. We have a system that does both. So you have a protocol you follow and you adapt it as yeah. a function of the... Yeah. We basically try to capture, we say capture six things. Quickly they are, we want to know what sequence people do things in in real life because mm -hmm. we teach things in that sequence. Always with an idea for its transfer. Mm -hmm. and so. We don't use taxonomies or arbitrary outlines for training. Mm -hmm. The first thing that people do when they are going to have to implement this knowledge is the first thing we train. Mm -hmm. If there is no sequence, our rule is we teach easier things before more difficult ones. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that, that's, and we pick up things like what new terms are some, is somebody going to have to recognize in order to accomplish a goal. If there are new concepts or locations or, or pieces of equipment they have to identify or whatever. Um, we, we pick up knowledge about process. How does this work? How, how does the, what's the larger picture that you're operating in when you're doing this? And we sometimes, not very often, but we sometimes have to then also pick up principles, cause and effect principles, for example, engineering principles or whatever, that might be important to somebody who's going to be asked to extend knowledge in some fashion in an area. But our real focus is on how do you act and decide step by step in order to accomplish this goal? And what happens when the situation changes in this particular way? And the results are, for example, just three weeks ago, I did a series of cognitive task analysis with surgeons at Northwestern <coughs> University. It turned out they were, I didn't know this, but I was interviewing people that were doing a certain type of surgery. And for the, the kind of, of, of experiences that they were getting in the university hospital, the, the students were all being taught to do this surgery in a certain way. And then they were going over to the, uh, to the hospital for the, uh, what, what is it, the uh, uh, retired military, what are they, what are they call it? Yeah. Vets hospitals. Yeah, yeah. And that's where they were doing their practice. And in the vets hospital, the conditions they were seeing were completely different than where they were trained. So they were making a lot of mistakes. A lot of people were getting hurt in surgery. In the CTA that I did with this person, we always vary the situation. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that he claimed to his students, you don't have to use this particular approach. And he didn't for this, the demonstration. 
but in the surgeries they were doing, it turned out they did. That came up in the CTA. They changed the approach for the students, and the problems went away. So how are you analyzing the interview data? What are you doing to analyze it? Well, when we are asking, it depends on what kind of question we're asking. One of the questions we ask is, how much information does each surgeon leave out mm -hmm. when we interview them? Because we have to interview a minimum of three. Mm -hmm. And with each surgeon, we get that much more information about the decisions and judgments. There are actually studies on this. That uh, we have a site, we have a, a, a chapter where we go through all the studies about mm -hmm. that, that people have done. It turns out you get an average of about 15% more information from each expert that you interview. And the first time you interview them, you get about 30% of the decisions that you need to make. Each new interview will give you about 15% more decisions because. Different experts are aware of different decisions that they make, apparently. And we never get 100%. Never. So there's always some discovery involved with students when they're trying to apply an approach. What we hope to get are the most critical decisions that are made for the conditions that people encounter that are the more standard, not highly rare or unusual ones, but the more standard ones. So have you developed like a rubric to analyze that interview data? I mean, how do you... Yeah. Yeah, we have a rubric. We have a way to determine whether two surgeons have given us, or two people, have given us different steps, but they're actually identical. Mm -hmm. And while they look different, it turns out that they are that they have the same function. Mm -hmm. And so there's two different ways to do the same thing. Uh, we do one other thing I hadn't mentioned, which we find is really important. We collect five problems that a person should be able to solve if they can correctly implement the protocol that we're trying to extract from an expert. And each problem has to be more complex and more novel and more rare. Mm -hmm. And we use them for practice exercises where we begin to build in what we call very practice over right. time. Where we throw little twists and, right. and uh, we change the problems so that they have to then constantly be, let's say, how, how would you put it? They, they, so that the knowledge they have becomes more generalizable right. over time. That's the other.